Good evening, everyone. Welcome. This is How Do I Renew My Mind? Of, and we're going to go into the bare essentials of that to make sure we understand how you renew your mind. How do you know when your mind is renewed? And the reason for renewing our mind. And so well, I hope you got your notebooks and your pens and your Bible. Renewing your mind is an important responsibility for the believer. Our first scripture, of course, you could probably guess. Romans 12, verse 2, and then Ephesians 4, 23, and then Philippians 2, 5. It may not be in that order, but we will definitely get to those and a couple more. So what is mind renewal and why do we do mind renewal? Simple answer, right? It's because the word of God tells us to do it. And if we have settled in our heart, that the word of God is the final authority in our lives as believers. I'll say it this way. As a believer, you got born again. Well, how do you know you're born again? And your answer is because I confess Jesus as my Lord. Well, my question would be, how do you know that's the way to be born again? Because his word says so. You're going to trust what you responded and did what the word said that one day your sins have been forgiven and that you will be with God in heaven. Very basic salvation. Am I right? It's based on the word. Well, with that same faith in God, trusting his word, it has to be our absolute final authority, meaning it settles every question, every discussion, because if not, if you don't see it in the word of God, rightly divided, like the scripture says in a couple different places, the scripture actually interprets scripture, says out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, all truth is established. Scripture is beneficial for exhortation for doctrine for training for correction and it's out of the mouth of two or more witnesses where they have agreed that truth is established we have to establish it in our hearts psalm 119 89 says forever O lord thy word is settled in heaven the word of god says today what it's always said for hundreds of years okay so they may have different versions but the original intent of the writer you go back to the root of what it was written in the hebrew or the greek and the original intent is there you get the original intent for salvation no matter what version you get born again from if you got born again from that or from someone sharing salvation for you because the original intent from God is that he so loved the world he gave his only son to pay the penalty for your sin so you doesn't have to and you confess him as Lord and then you are born again okay we won't go any further than that but tonight we're going to go into mind renewal because that is so essential to walking out this born again life turn over to romans 12 i'm going to read verse 1 just for the sake of reading it and go into our verse verse 2 it says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service here we go in verse 2 and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god it's not separating good will of god acceptable will of god or perfect will good or acceptable he's like hanging all those descriptors on the will of god which is good and acceptable is perfect one god he is perfect he is holy and his will is perfect for us it says i beseech you therefore brethren i want to look into these few words these three words transformed renew and perhaps to prove we'll see how far we get in the niv version that's the new international version verse two it says do not conform any longer 
to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will for you. I like to say this with transformation by renovation. The word conformed. Conformed means to be like pushed into a mold. Did you ever play with um, clay or putty or Play-Doh? <laughs> I don't know. Am I dating myself? Do they still have Play-Doh? Anyway, they get these little like cookie cutter shapes or these little things that you squish the Play-Doh through and it molds it, brings it out into this mold like spaghetti or a flower or something like that. Or you could press this into a mold. That's what that word conformed basically means. Don't be pushed in to a form. He says, don't be conformed. Don't be pushed into the form of this world. It says, assuming an outward expression that does not come from within. Don't be conformed. Don't be pushed into a mold like this world for life. Like life, it does not represent who you are inside. It's your new man. It says that does not come from within, nor is representative of his inner heart life. Don't be pushed into the mold, like from the outside pressure to get you to have an outlook on life, I'll say. Since we're going into mind renal, okay, it says, but don't let the world push you into how you look at life based on what's from the outside. That doesn't represent who you are inside. Your new creature, your new nature, your new self. That's who you are. I am a child of God. I have God's nature. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Repeat that after me. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I have God's nature. I have God's nature. I am the righteousness of God in I, Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So he says, don't be conformed. Don't let them push you into a mold. We're supposed to let that life on the inside of us come out. That's where we respond to life from and not based on the outward pressure. So we don't react but we respond from the spirit of who we are, okay? God's new nature that he gave us. And this is how we do this. He says, but be transformed. Now this word transformed is the metamorphomia. Yes, it sounds like metamorphosis. And then we think of a butterfly, which is probably the most perfect picture that could be given you about being transformed okay it's something inside of that caterpillar that when he gets into the cocoon when you can't see him be transformed just like your transformation took place in the spirit where you cannot see he says but if you give yourself to the word like paul exhorted timothy and be a good student of it he said that your profiting will appear to all so the time you spend renewing your mind to what god's word says about you that metamorphosis takes place and that new man begins to shine out three john two beloved i wish above all things that you prosper. It's not talking just about money, right? You're profiting of this life of God that's in you, that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So right now we want our soul to prosper and we're believing that it is our mind, our will and our emotions. So we're gonna talk about our mind. It says, but be transformed, be changed. It speaks of the act of the person changing his outward expression to not be like the world to a whole different expression it's an expression that comes and is representative from your inner man so let your outlook and your reaction to life reflect that from your inner man and not how the world would react this is the um greek translation 
change your outward expression from that which you had before salvation, your outward expression, not just saying, here's my expression, if you're mad, if you're happy, not that kind of expression. It's just your whole demeanor reflect your inner being out of the abundance of your heart. Not just your heart, we, I believe God, or, oh, I have love and affection. It's your internal self is your true self, not what we put on so we can make people believe something about us, okay? Or we withhold our true selves from people because we make ourselves vulnerable and we don't want to get hurt or we don't want anyone to judge us or to think lower of ourselves. He says, but let that expression not come from that outward pressure, but let it come from the inner man of the heart. Just like he says, oh, no man, anything, but to love them with the love of God that is in us. So we're changing our outward expression from that which we had before salvation to an expression that comes from that new man living on the inside of us. So we're not going to be conformed but we're going to be transformed, no longer living like we did before Jesus, but we're going to live from the inside out. And this Romans two tells us how to do that. It says by renewing, it says do this by renewing. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek. It says it's the gradual renewing. Gradual means it's not going to happen in an instance. Some healings and miracles are sometimes in, instant, but the renewing of your mind is a conforming, a gradual conforming of the man more and more to the new spiritual world in which he has been introduced when he was born again. And that in which we we now live in Christ the bible says in him we live and move and have our being that is what we're renewing our mind to everything that that would mean for us so we're actually fellow workers with god in this not in salvation but in cooperating with god the holy spirit who's working in us always to will and do his good pleasure. And he does it by the word of God. That is the change of the outward expression is dependent upon the renovation, the complete change for the better of the believer's mental process. So the renewing of your mind has to do with the way you process things and then react. Sometimes this happens in an instant. You don't have time to stop and think. It's just, you know, it's like getting a tube of toothpaste. It's on the counter just going, pow. And what comes out, comes out. It's in those pressured moments of what comes out. That's really what's in you. So that's a good sign to yourself. What we need to all work on. This is accomplished through the ministry of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, who when infinitely and intelligently and habitually yielded to. And so you're, we're yielding to him. To yield, all that means is slow down and give way to another. Slow down. Consider we may not know it all. Just when I think that I know something, I know nothing. Does that make sense? After being in ministry, I guess, 30 years, preaching overseas, seeing so many healings and miracles, you think I'd know something. But the more I know, I know nothing except Christ and him crucified. That's what it all comes back to, y'all. So this is accomplished through the ministry of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Say, thank you, Father, thank you, Father for, your son. for your Son. Thank you for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And if Paul says, be being filled, then you want to invite the Holy Spirit to yield to him and express to him, fill me, Holy Spirit, with yourself. Meaning you have to yield sometimes. If someone's coming by you, you yield, right? You move out of the way. Some places in our lives, we need to just let go and move out of the way and let him move in and begin to transform our outlook on life concerning some things. So we do that intelligently, making a clear and conscious decision 
We do it like a habit, habitually, repetition, consistency, frequency, and action, meaning we respond to the Word of God, not only in physical doing. Sometimes the doing is changing the way we think so we could change what we're speaking. The purpose, I know we like to do um, memory verses and my handout index cards, so vitally important, but we do not um, memorize verses just for the sake of memorizing verses. We memorize verses so we could change the way we think about something. So the NIV, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What are we being transformed into the image and likeness of Christ? right? That's the only thing he says, that we're growing up into him. Not that we grow up spiritually. No, he, because the Bible says of his fullness, it pleased the father that in him, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in Jesus and of his fullness, we have all received. So in the spirit, we're all grown up. We are grown up sons of God we grow up into walking in that grown up spirit by the renewing of our minds not that we're babies perhaps immature in understanding and implementing truth in our lives however we grow up into him and so this part of salvation first part justification okay when the new nature of god was implanted into us and then the Holy Spirit infills us and, be, and sanctifies us that we may be holy and blameless. The Holy Spirit is sanctifying us as we cooperate with him to grow up into Christ. Philippians 2, 5, just one of my uh, good scripture to throw in here. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what mind was in Christ? He yielded to the Father. He didn't do anything unless he saw the Father do it, right? He was revealed to himself through the Word of God. He didn't say anything unless he heard the Father say it, okay? He testified of it that he always does the will of the Father. He yielded his life to give it for a ransom. That's why he spent his life. He didn't have any other agenda. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the way we think should be like Jesus. He knew the will of God. He spoke of it often and how he only did the Father's will. So we're renewing our mind to prove, approve, inspect that perfect will of God that we would walk in it one area is forgiveness we think we have this down i have no unforgiveness right but if you're holding a laundry list against someone that it comes up again when you get mad at them again or they fluster you once more and you go back and rehearse anything from the past you're keeping a laundry list And if we're going to forgive, like he tells us to forgive, first of all, it's seven times no, 70 times seven. He says, forgive, and then your father will forgive you. If you stand praying, forgive. Not that forgiveness gets in the way of you receiving healing. However, it will hinder, but condemn your own heart the Bible says. The enemy will use it to condemn yourself because you hold unforgiveness. And when Jesus gives us the command to forgive, like he father forgave us, we have the ability to forgive because we've been forgiven. He doesn't hold it against us. If we brought it up, he's going to go, what sin? All he sees when he looks at us is Jesus. And in our born again state, if we make a mistake we do not have sin because we don't have a sin nature so when we sin we miss the mark fall short of walking in righteousness he says we have an advocate with the father our lord jesus christ 
then we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we should stand there. If we know truth about concerning who we are in Christ and our new nature, just what that is created in righteousness and true holiness, we would stand there acknowledging, thank you for cleansing me of all unrighteousness. But that doesn't mean that you could sin and just fluff it away or stick it under a rug and dismiss it. He says, no, you have to confess it. Oftentimes, when things happen in our lives, we're confessing everybody else's sin against us. But it doesn't say to confess their sins. It says, forgive them their sins. Confess your own sin. Maybe in the mix of that, we have um, confessed their sin. They did this, they did that, but that's not scriptural. You wonder why we're not free? Wonder why we feel condemnation, like we're not worthy? We don't measure up? Why would God want to heal me? Or that he's holding aught against us? He holds no aught. He gives us all 100% forgiveness. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? With Jesus, he gave us everything. That's why it's better promises. It just goes, whoa, how awesome is God? Even though I sin, but we don't have a habit to sin. Like we don't want to continue to live in sin and do unrighteousness or unright, not right, because it's not our nature to do that because we don't have that sin nature. Our nature now is a nature of God and it's a nature of love because God is love and that's unconditional. Look, while we were all yet sinners, Christ died for us. Does everybody accept him? No, we know that answer, no. Are there people that die and go to hell? Yes, yet he died for them. And so forgiveness, don't hold a laundry list. It also says that as I renew my mind here in Romans 12, 2, that I will experience this transformation and know the perfect will of God. That metamorphosis as I renew my mind from the inside out, how I have that outlook on life will be changed. Say it's a process. It is a process further today than where I was yesterday, but I'm going to be further tomorrow than where we are today. All right. So it is actually a continual yielding to the inner working of the Holy Spirit through the word of God to change my outward expression or my outlook on life to match my inner being. And that comes from renew my mind. Will you say that again? Absolutely. So it's a continual yielding to the word of God, change your mind, replace your thoughts, consider that you just might not know it correctly. Definition of insanity. We're doing the same things and, you know, doing the same thing and you're trying to get a different result. You're not going to get a different result. We have to renew our mind. We have to look and perceive and have an outlook on life differently from our new man perspective, which is in a whole different position than what our old man was and how this body like functioned, how our soul functioned. That's what's under construction right now, our soul. Work out your salvation that is able to save your soul. It's the word of God that is an anchor to our soul. So when our boats get to rocking and the reeling and the storm, right? The word of God stands firm. That's why we have to settle, be established, strengthened, settled in the word. So no matter what the storm, we're gonna plant ourselves in Jesus. So we're being transformed in order to prove the perfect will of God. So our way of thinking is renovated, is changed. Ephesians 4.23, it says, I'm going to start, it's actually verse 24. I'll start in verse 20. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now listen to the direct Greek. 
is to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Again, that word renewed means to be renovated by an inward reformation. All that means is be changed. When my um, brother-in-law and sister-in-law were renovating, they moved here and they actually, first time I ever saw, saw a pure, true, complete renovation of a home. And they tore it down to the studs. Let me tell you, here's what happens if we're not completely given over and yielded to the Lord to allow him to change some things because he got most of the old damp smell out because he saw where it was leaking he tore a drywall he even changed some um beams some framework whatever you call them the internal structure everything plumbing electric everything cleaned out they basically built a new house all right but in this one corner you would have not known anything was wrong except for what was more evident was just the drywall since they tore it all out okay, they took it out and behind this wall was this tiny little leak just spraying and it was filled with this black mold well we all hate black mold right because you know that's not good for us and so they would have never known if they would have done a halfway job to be complete we have to completely yield ourselves to the lord let me go on so i could get this it says here created and righteous is sorry human rational disposition the expression of the old man needs to be renovated and just like he did on their home we need a complete renovation nothing of the old way or old outlook our old way of thinking processing looking at life and making decisions it all has to change it all has to come now through the new nature of us which is christ jesus is our example is our only example not another man not anyone's experience not um even if you read a good book the best preacher in town not them not anyone's testimony but christ alone if y'all know that song in christ alone yeah it's pretty meaningful right he's the only one all right so our way of thinking the attitude of our minds are changed to be like christ jesus so you might have been saying your outlook or you may have heard another term your paradigm paradigm it's your point of view in life has been created and structured build perception of life out of your outlook or your paradigm your collection of who you are how you process thought or react to certain things for different reasons have been built throughout your life and then christ came in it's like getting a new um program and trying to put it in a computer from the 1980s it's not going to work and so people try to function out of what the bible says is the new man your new life based on an old computer which is your paradigm that has to be transformed you're going to have to get a new operating system in christ and the Holy Spirit rewires you, takes from God and rewires your soul. So you have built a whole new outlook on life. It's almost, Jerry likes to call it the backwards church. You know, you live by dying. You receive by giving. When the world thinks, no, you hold on to, so you have. No, you give it away, so you have. You die to live, right? You, you humble yourself to be exalted it's the paradigm a different way of thinking like the kingdom of god this new man so you may have heard the paradigm to think like christ we need to change our minds have a mind shift or a paradigm shift let's just simply say a mind shift or change our point of view so to do that we have to change locations right to see something differently like we have a couple different places in our yard. I like to watch the deer come into our yard mid-morning and 
Yes, we feed them because I like to watch them. I love to see the little babies. And I could look out of one window and get a certain view, but it's obstructed. I'm not seeing clearly. Or I could go to the big picture window and look out and see clearly. For us to change locations to see and to perceive life clearly through the mind of Christ, we have to change locations. Our location in Christ who we are in him. So we may be looking at some situations or circumstances in our lives, but when we look at it through the new man and change our locations, have that mind shift, we have a whole different point of view. Now, people's perception, your perception is definitely your reality. That doesn't make it good or bad. It, it just is. It just is our outlook. But that doesn't mean it's true. It's simply just the way you view things. Everyone's programming of that paradigm, of that outlook, or everyone's forming, right, that forms over time, the point of view forms over time, is different. Why? Because everyone's gone through good times, bad times, different experiences, They've dealt with different traumas, fears, pains. All of this is what created our point of view or our paradigm in life. The way you act or react to various things, such a variety. But the point of view are built upon belief. That's what we're going to act upon, whether it's right or wrong. As a born again believer, we talked about that. What? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And we've been bought with a price, spirit, soul, and body. Like we're his. And it, it instructs us what to do with it. Now, it tells us here to renew our minds, to be a partaker of abundant life. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief came to steal, kill, destroy. I've come to give you life and life abundantly. And if we're not partaking of this abundant life, then what is it that we don't understand? Because God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You may see him different from the old covenant to the new covenant. Old covenant, he dealt with a man with a sinful nature. New covenant, he's dealing with a new nature man. A nature man with a nature that he created in his image, in his likeness, according to his righteousness. Two different covenants, two different peoples, two different ways he dealt with humanity. However, how could he say he's never changed? His character and nature has never changed. He's always been Jehovah Rapha in the Old Testament. God that heals. God that protects. God, Jehovah Shalom, God, your peace. He's the same. And through Jesus Christ, who came to show us the Father's character and nature, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that's what Jesus came to do, to show us the Father. He said, have you seen me? You've seen the Father. That's his character and his nature to bless you. Now, let's go back to this. It's like this. Before you were born, born again, you looked at the world and interpreted the world like a sinner okay like the world now that we've changed natures we must change our point of view and renew our mind as the bible says because the word tells us to do so if he this is our standard and the new testament let me tell you why the new testament is so important because he's given us everything we need for life and godliness romans 8 32 it says how shall he not with him with christ jesus freely give us all things he didn't give us christ jesus in the old testament that's why i am a little bit of a stickler but get a new testament why because that's better promises it's based on who you are your nature you have this i can guarantee you have this the old covenant the promises that was for part people living under the law that can never be just before God until Jesus. And so when he said he has freely given us all things, you can stand on that. He's put the Holy Spirit dwells in us to bring us understanding that the office the Holy Spirit lives in 
to lead us into all truth. And whatsoever it talks about Jesus, he's going to reveal that unto us. Because that's who we are. Who we are in Christ. It's his favorite subject to show us. So Jesus said, I always do those things that please the Father. He knew the will of the Father. We have the mind of Christ. We have the capacity to know the Father's perfect will, to walk by faith in it and please him. And you can't say no more argument about do I have enough faith. You ask Jesus to be your savior. You believe one day you won't go to hell and you'll be with God in heaven. You confident of that? That's great faith. Something you're believing, why wouldn't you believe all these other promises? We have to look at this differently instead of always trying to get something to believe what he's already done for us and given us in this new covenant because of our new nature of who we are. So we begin to renew our mind. This is the work that we put in as a believer. And the struggle is actually just the way we think. Are we willing to give up? Well, it's always been this way or this way, or I don't understand. You know, you don't argue with the word. You ask help of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of you. And if you don't believe you don't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, all you have to do is ask him. He's already right there. You're already born of his nature. Receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I believe, I receive. I say the enemy is only as strong in your life as the lie that we believe. So our the mind, the way we think and perceive has to be renovated. Everything change the way we see things did you know that the word repent means to change the way you think just means to turn around go another way we don't want to be doing the same thing expected different results right so stop what you're doing or stop what you're thinking turn around change the way you think oftentimes if i've ministered healing to you or any of our team members have you'll know that after we minister to you, sometimes I'll say, okay, what are you thinking right now? Because if your expectation is, it's gonna come back based on history, that it always came back, guess what? It's going to come back, you're inviting it back. But if you believe that by the stripes of Jesus, you're healed, and the stripes of Jesus was enough to complete that work and in you that your body will respond and you expect the word of God to be stronger than the word or the lies of the enemy. We're supposed to put our trust in him. Our expectation is in God. No, it won't come back. It won't come back in Jesus name. It won't. And so, when you minister to, we don't mind ministering to you. However, B, we try to teach people because yes, we could get them healed on our faith. But even John Lake, if you find his full quote, he says, however, if you don't renew your mind, you're going to keep it. You've got to understand it is yours. He can't take it away. That's a lie. We are not the sick trying to get well we are the healed of the lord it's the children's bread that's our sustenance life and health and walking in divine health allowing what's on the inside of us to even come out through our soul affecting our mortal bodies it's romans 8 11 right the same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwells in us he shall also quicken, make alive our mortal body by his spirit. And if we renew our mind, I trust me, will you try to meditate on that and let it consume you that you have fight everything in the natural will show up. What about this pain? What about that pain? What about this? And this came back and that came back. Throw it away. It's a lie. It is not in the word of God. This has to be our final authority. We have to renew our minds. And so when it comes to um, forgiveness, the Bible is pretty clear. We can't keep a laundry list. 
it's not okay to hold on to things we have to forgive do you have an issue with that um you could write these scriptures down i'm not going to go into it matthew 5 verse 43 to 48 and then luke 17 3 how many times do you do this every day all the day if it's every day every hour this don't hold on to unforgiveness it's poison it it grows into bitterness and bitterness is the rottenness of your soul the bible says it says a many will be defiled so nip it in the bud get rid of it if you have to go to the father every hour he's right there with you anyway he already knows all the truth so you might as well just come clean with him because he already knows we got to be honest with ourselves that's why james talks about looking in the mirror and we walk away deceiving ourselves so our paradigm our outlook should be in and through christ and all the scriptures that talk about us and him and him in us and us together if you read i think it's in john chapter 14 through 17 those are so very foundational and very important so our point of view is made up of our beliefs and most vital belief is what we think about god it's how we see God in respect to us or us in respect to God. Proverbs thirteen twelve. in two weeks, four different people brought this up to me and I wanted to make sure that I'll address it. It says hope deferred makes the heart sick. True, the Bible says that. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. What was the desire? Jesus. Didn't I just tell you he didn't hold anything back? People could stand on that because, oh, I'm not, I'm not healed, hope deferred. What are they saying? Stop and think. What are you believing about that? That you actually believe that your God's withholding something from you? Go back to the new covenant. Romans 8, verse 32, I believe that's it. How shall he not with him? freely give us all things and there should never be a question about healing or the forgiveness of sins he shall not with him freely give us all things and so i hope we put that one to not and then first peter 2 24 so our belief about god sometimes are skewed because we have not considered this is about god his character and nature Right, Jesus came, he goes, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He revealed Father's character and nature. He pulled Israel into a people to be make a covenant with the people so the world would know he was a covenant keeping God. That what he said, he keeps covenant. That was his whole purpose for making a covenant with the children of Israel, that he was a covenant keeping God. We could trust him. What he says to us in our new covenant, that's our covenant. I don't want to look at a a dead man's covenant. I'm alive in Christ. I have a covenant with God. I have promises. I could trust him. I may not understand it, but it says we're not supposed to lean on our understanding. We're supposed to renew our understanding and receive revelation understanding from who? God, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and he brings understanding to us through the word. That's why it's important for us to be in the word and not in everyone else's writings. In the word, we have our Bible program. It's online. You can look at it. Go to where the audio videos are. You can read through the New Testament. That's why I'm so big on, I don't care what Bible program you're you're reading through, just read the word. And since our life is such a vapor, that it's good to find out what our new covenant is all about while we're on this planet mind renewal doesn't happen overnight and if you got born again later in life like i did i want to make sure i grew up into him into the fullness of christ producing the fruit of god's life christ my jesus's life in me and through me finishing his ministry that ministry of reconciliation so our belief about God, our point of view comes from another bird, different places. Like I said, it's built over time. Our view of God, 
maybe some of these areas. So our view of life or definitely of God was built through things others have told us. We collect things through life, things that were preached to us, whether in church, whatever kind of church you were in, a denomination, a Christian church, a non-Christian, it doesn't matter. Your paradigm of your point of view is being formed. What denomination taught you, your what your parents taught you, what you believe the Bible said, your culture, your surroundings, things that you have gone through, um, that all teaches you that's all you're going to react and respond to life through those things. It could be, like I said earlier in the teaching, through experiences, through trauma. One day I was driving down the street, and yes, I was already in ministry, already preaching, on my way actually to go to the mission field, and driving through this one intersection, not a busy road, and here comes this kid in this big truck, and he kind of comes and turns, he's coming real fast it's early in the morning and he sideswipes me i had a green light after that i believe god i was fine all that stuff walked in it but this is years and years later driving down the road here in bryson city with my husband and every red light i come to not red like green light i'm slowing down like as if it was a red light and he got a little bit flustered when he goes, what are you doing? You always do that. And I'm thinking, do what? He goes like, you're going to stop and it's green. I'm like, oh, do I? Through that trauma, fear came in. It's a form of fear, fear, anxiety, all that. It's a form of fear that I wasn't even realizing I reacted to that trauma. And then I was aware of it. And I begin to speak to her. I'm like, no. And I had to work on it. Every time I had to be conscious when I'm going through an intersection, not slowing down, it's green. Of course, I look and I can proceed. Then the next time I would look and green light, we go. Right? I had to get off of that. And I had to can speak the word of God. No. I don't have a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I have no fear. The peace of God. I'm secure in Him. And I got over it. But that was on me for years that I was not even aware of. So those paradigms, the way we react and stuff, come on us. We're not even aware of it. Other people will be aware, but we seem to not be aware of it. That's a mind, something in our, the mind that needs to have a shift. And so I'm sure you've heard it said, or someone might have said it to you, these kind of phrases also. And we excuse certain things, certain reactions, certain outlooks. Oh, that's just the way we've always done it. Well, in some certain area that used to be my husband's reaction. <laughs> then one day I put my hands on my hips and I'm like, well, how's that working for you? Only because I would do that to myself. It's just not working. What is it that I do not understand? And the Holy Spirit's good to bring you understanding, but he's going to do it through his word. So it's important to get in the word. Yes, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expected different results. I couldn't just ignore my reaction now that it came to the light. I addressed it. It was fear that that might happen to me again. Same thing when you were praying for people. What is that knee jerk reaction? You're looking for it like it might come back or is it gone? So I tell you, get up, do something you couldn't do. So you can see it's gone. Then why let it back in if it left you? Don't let it back in. No, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I stood here for 20 minutes healed. Get off of me. Amen. Mark 7 verse 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders? This is when they're eating the bread, right? with the unwashed hands jesus answered and he said unto them 
Well, as Elias prophesied to you, hypocrites, as it is written, this people honored me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, in your paradigm, your heart of man, it's all in there. It's, it's, it's the heart of what makes you up and how you perceive life. But that transformation from the, the new man having preeminence through your soul and how you're going to respond, okay, your mind, the way you process all the information in your outlook or in your paradigm will feed your mind to react to that. It has to be filled with the truth of God's word. First Timothy 3 verse 9, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience you know in your conscience whether you're right or not with god matthew 5 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god well with seeing there is a perception what is our perception of god when you consider god think about any situation or circumstance that you go through that you'd like to see more victory in what is your perception of God concerning that situation in life? What is it that you believe about that situation? And then consider, did I get that from the Bible? Sometimes perhaps you people will pick things up based on a loved one and what they went through. And the loved one went through something and at some point came to a conclusion based on their experience. And now you pick up that belief because that was the outcome. But was that based on what God's word says? Or was it based on just a situation that didn't line up with the word of God? Experiences for the born again believer, experiences do not dictate our lives, neither should they. But our experiences should line up with the word of God. And that truth of the word of God should be coming through us. We shouldn't just allow life to happen. We should make life happen. Your life is what you're expecting out of your perception, through your outlook, through your paradigm, truth and realities. What looks and feels real to you may not be truth. Only God's word is truth. So in closing, here's a few questions that can help locate maybe our perception of God by his character and nature. I remember, let me ask your testimony. A lot of you know that when I got saved, I was healed of cancer at 18 months to live. What a lot of you don't know is that I have gone through a couple counter attacks when the enemy tried to put the cancer back on me. This is before I was married, before Jerry. <laughs> it was the BJ before Jerry. And we got married, what, 10 years ago now. So it was before that. I went just for a regular checkup because I knew the truth. They tried to say something. And I was like shocked because it hit me blindsided. I went out into the lobby. They had like a big waiting room in the lobby. And I sat on the chair and I was like this. Try to call my pastor. Try to call my pastor's wife. Try to call my best friend who was strong in the word and couldn't reach anyone. And I could feel these emotions rising up like on my shoulders rush of emotions through my mind thoughts like a freight train and i sat there and i took control of my soul and i'll say okay i rec identified fear what am i afraid of am i afraid that you healed me and took it back or am i afraid that it got back in how could that I didn't even understand. I mean, I knew enough to know he can't come back. But what was I fearful of? And I stopped myself. Like he tried to feed me those lies. And I'm like, no. And I got up and I said, by the stripes of Jesus. Yeah, people thought I was crazy. I don't care. When it's life and death for you, you know what? you're not really going to care. When you get over what other people might think about you, then it's you and God all the way. When he's all you have, he's all you need. And I'm like, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. So then they scheduled me for a CAT scan, like right away. I went in there. They did an MRI afterwards. 
couple weeks later got me in for an MRI and they go, well, what we found was it's just like a speck. It could have been a speck of dust. And all I said to them was, oh, change your lens. Right. But let me tell you, that was worth keeping my mouth like this right? But just not talking isn't the victory. I just didn't want the garbage that was coming to my mind to come out of my mouth because I had a revelation that life and death is in the power of the tongue. It's one of the first lessons I've learned when I got born again. My pastor in Yorktown, Virginia, where I got saved, the first sermon I ever heard him preach. And I went because I knew it was true. See, I was 30 years old when I was diagnosed with cancer i was in the military on my way to desert storm they went to operate on a hernia found cancer i had 18 months to live i called out on god i never read the bible before in my life i had the bible i'm thinking you know it would make me go to sleep first place i looked at was come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden i'll give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm meek and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. I knew I didn't know God. I knew I needed rest for my soul. And I called on, on him. I said, God, if you're real, if any of this is true, I didn't know what was in it. I said, give me my life back, and it's yours. Like, I, ha I made a bargain with God. Um, that's not why he healed me. He healed me because by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I learned that. But once I figured out two months later that I got born again, ended up in this church, found out life and death are in the power of my words, I went like this. I quit talking for a week. I just learned that was the first thing until I knew what to say. But see, just because you know what to say, it's still not working for you. And so you have to renew your mind. We memorize things to internalize. It says receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save your soul. And so Smith Wiggleworth says it this way, consume the word until it consumes you and then act on it. We're acting on it, trying to get it to happen and then we're thinking what aren't we doing but that's in every realm of life why isn't this happening why don't i have this why don't i have that renew your mind saturate yourself with the word of god until it saturates you and then act on it some of the questions we may ask is god angry at me this is the first thing i got a hold of myself when i had that diagnosis okay i had fear what am I afraid of? I'm not afraid. I don't have a spirit of fear. I have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And I start speaking truth from who I am in Christ instead of that which is outside trying to conform me to the world. The doctors thought I was crazy because I gave no sign of worry, no sign of concern, no sign of woe is me or Oh, I just went stoic and I didn't allow my soul, my emotions to react. I, we have to really learn and it's not easy. It's not an easy thing. Take command of our soul. It is an instrument to be transformed by us renewing our mind. So if you ask these questions, is God angry? Is he angry at me or how can I please him as if you're not pleasing him? Am I pleasing God? Do I have to be afraid that God will punish me if I don't get this right? Do I feel I'm reaping what I sow? What must I do to get God to accept me and bless me with this, with my healing or with my ministry or with a husband or with a wife or with a, I don't know, abundance or whatever you're doing? Will he be displeased if I fail or if I make a mistake? How could I know and see God? I already answered that. Look at Jesus. He came to refill the Father. Am I going through this because I have to learn something from it? That's a big emphatic no. That's a lie. Don't believe that. I really want to encourage you. Work on yourself. The fruit, the ministry, how you minister to others. 
will come out of renewing your mind, you have to cooperate with that. Amen.